like walk through on dry land. He did it for us. Not for them, you might say, but, but here's something for us, for his people. He feeds us. He nourishes us. He protects and speaks to us. And so tired, weary, worried sheep find rest by accepting the invitation of our God, our shepherd king, to come into his presence and to worship him. Tired, weary, worried sheep find rest by focusing less on our worries and more on our great shepherd who carries our burdens and lifts them off us as we bow down and worship. Years later, Jesus arrives in Israel and he picks up on this shepherding imagery as well and declares himself in one of those great, wonderful, bold I am statements to be the divine shepherd king. He says to the people there expecting a saviour, I am the good shepherd. I am the one who knows each of his sheep personally. It's the same language as in verse uh, 7 of Psalm 95. We are the sheep of his hand. It's as though as we walk into his pasture, Jesus counts us off and says, yep, I know you, you're in. Yeah, I know you, Fred, you're in. He is our divine shepherd king, beckoning us to find rest by coming into his presence and worshipping him. And so our rest is found in Christ alone. For he's not just our king who rules us, but our senior pastor who cares for us. And he wants to carry our worries and our burdens. But we've got to come into his presence in the first place if we're to find that rest. Thirdly, if we want to find rest, we need to listen to God's voice because our past warns us. If we want to find the rest we so desperately crave, we must listen to God's voice because our past warns us. Well, the procession has finished. God's people are in the temple and they bow down and worship and now silence falls upon God's people. But it's not a total silence because God now speaks. As the praise of God stops, God reminds us of our past. He says, in your worship, in your bowing down, open your ears. In your worship, hear my voice. Listen to your senior pastor. And his voice is a voice of warning. He reminds us of our failures, of our ancestors' failures to inherit the rest, to inherit the promised land of Canaan. Look down at the second half of verse 7 and verse 8. We can see it there. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. The story is probably a familiar one. God's people have escaped Egypt. They've seen the miraculous work of God bringing them across the, the Red Sea on dry land. Uh, they've seen Pharaoh and his chariots drown in the waters behind them. They've experienced salvation. And the first thing they do rightly in Exodus 15 is they sing, a pra- they sing a song. They praise God, their warrior king who's fought for them. And yet, just days later, we read in Exodus 17 that they're grumbling. Oh, it's better in Egypt. Moses, God, why have you brought us out of Egypt to leave us here with no water in the desert? Ah, he doesn't care for us. They've forgotten their past. Their past just days before. They've forgotten what God has done. And they grumble and they grumble and they test God. They fail to trust God in the present in light of their salvation in the past. In short, our writer says they are guilty of unbelief. And there were consequences. Uh, Look at the end of the psalm. There we clearly see the consequences. 
they failed to enter God's rest. Unbelief led to a failure to inherit the promised land. And if you hadn't noticed, this is God himself speaking. There's a voice change there in verse 9. God is warning them. God is reminding them of their past failures. There's no error of judgment here, no getting it wrong. This is what happened. The judge himself, their senior pastor, declares that they were guilty of unbelief. Well, why does God warn these people again in this psalm? You know, David is writing this psalm uh, hundreds or a thousand plus years after the Exodus. Why is he recounting that experience? Here's why. Because there's a very real danger that the present people of God might fail to inherit the rest of heaven. They might fail to enter the rest of God's presence. Sure, they can look at their past and say, we've experienced salvation. But if they're not bowing down in the present, if they're not coming into God's presence now in worship, if they're more interested in their idols, they will fail to enter the rest that God has promised. The rest of heaven. That's why in verse 7, halfway through, the psalmist writes, Today, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't follow the way of your ancestors. Unbelief today leads to a failure to inherit the promised rest of heaven. And that's where the psalm ends. And you kind of go, well, it's incomplete, isn't it? God's people have processed. Uh, they've bowed down and worshipped. They've heard God's voice, but, well, we're not told how they responded. We want verse 12, don't we? We want to know how they responded. It's an open ending. Why? Because each subsequent generation, each generation that can say today, which if we haven't put two and two together is us here as well today, we need to hear the warning today that if we harden our hearts, we will fail to inherit the rest of heaven. Which is exactly the point the New Testament makes. So as we come out of our shadows and look back at our shadows of the Old Testament now, through the light of the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament, in the light of Jesus' saving work, he's going to say the same thing. So please, in your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 onwards. And I guess if you turn there, the first thing you're going to notice as you scan down is that great chunks of this psalm that we've just read are being quoted. Our writer of Hebrews in the New Testament is quoting that, and look how it begins, chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, not as David the psalmist writes, but as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice. Do you see what God is saying to us? God is saying to Hope Church here in 2022, today, if we fail to hear God's voice, if we harden our heart, if we're guilty of unbelief, we will not inherit eternal life we will not experience the salvation that God is offering. There is a real danger for every single one of us standing and sitting that we could fail to inherit heaven. Is that a shock to you? But what about the once saved, always saved line that Christians like to throw out? But what about that? Doesn't our author believe in that? Well, read through the book of Hebrews and you can judge that one for yourself. Uh, doesn't he know that I'm baptised? Doesn't he know, know I grew up in the Church of England or the Methodist Church or the Free Church? Doesn't he know that I'm a member of Hope Church, a member of the leadership team? Doesn't he know I'm the pastor? How could he say I could fail to inherit the rest of heaven? Because he knows our hearts. 
He knows how quickly we go astray. We know how quickly we chase our idols, how quickly our hearts can harden. And so he says today there's a real danger that every single one of us could fail to inherit the rest of heaven. Look at chapter 3 and verse 12. Hebrews 3 verse 12. Look at the warning given to the church today. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But, and here's how we can avoid it, but exhort one another daily, ex- encourage each other daily, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of of sin. What could make us fail to inherit the rest? Sin. And look where sin begins. Look at verse 12. Where does that sin begin? It's in our hearts. Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Uh, Or look at Hebrews 3 verse 15. Where does sin begin there? Someone shout it out. Do do not harden your heart. Sin begins in your heart. All right, what about chapter 4 and verse 7? Where does sin begin there? In your hearts. All right, chapter 4, verse 12. Where does sin begin there? In your heart. You see, we're we're sheep, aren't we? And sheep, if we're honest, are stupid animals. Stupid animals like me need reminding time after time that sin begins in my heart. My failure to inherit the rest of heaven will begin here in my heart. Sin is a heart issue. And it begins by having these things closed by having my ears shut off from the word of God, from the voice of God, and then choosing in my heart to obey something else. But perhaps more frightening is that refusing and ref- refusing to hear and refusing to obey today, having a hard heart today, means that tomorrow my heart is another percent harder. And the day after that it's another two percent harder. And eventually it becomes so hard that this is just a shut book on a bookshelf. And I don't even bother want to listen to it at all. And then the rest of heaven is for the person next door, not for me. Which is why out through Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, the writer keeps coming back to the same point. Today, as long as it's called today, don't harden your heart and miss out on the rest to come. Or flipping it on its head, he says, strive to enter the rest of heaven today by having a soft heart and open ears. He's saying, return to Christ, the author and the accomplisher of your salvation. Return to Christ, your good shepherd. Return to Christ, your senior pastor, with open ears and a soft heart. And you will make it to the rest of heaven. And so the medicine that we all need for a hard heart is soft ears, open ears and a soft heart, open ears to the voice of God. That's why the word of God is so central to our gathered worship, because we firmly believe that this is where we hear the voice of God as the Holy Spirit takes it from the pages and applies it to our hearts. It's why in our home groups the word of God is important. It's why we encourage individuals and families in their own to to read uh, read the Bible together. Not as an end in itself, but that we might hear the voice of God and have open ears and soft hearts that we might inherit the rest of heaven. This is the relationship the writer makes himself between the word of God, the voice of God, and the rest of heaven. Look at chapter 4 and verse 11 of Hebrews. 
Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Yeah, okay, we've, we've heard that, we've got that. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You see, if we have an open Bible and if we have open ears and a soft heart, we'll hear the voice of God and the Spirit will do his work. He'll convict us of our sin. He'll show us what we're really like and he'll shine a huge torch upon Christ and show us what he's like in all his glory. And we'll want to follow him more and more. Uh, But you say, I'm no reader. I can't read. I'm illiterate. I just don't find reading easy, if that's us. I'm an audio-visual learner. Wonderful. Wonderful. Because you're with the majority through history. Can I have the next picture? This is an artist's impression from the 15 and the 1600s. And in those days, many people, the majority of people, were illiterate. And so they gathered, before they went off to work, to hear the word of God. Not to read, but to hear the word of God read and preached. They found ways around their illiteracy. If we can't read, that's okay. Because one of the blessings of technology is that you've got your phones and you've got free apps where you can have the Bible read in any language, probably with any voice as well. And if you don't like listening by yourself, come and join a home group. And if you don't want to join a home group, give me a phone call and I'll delight to come and read with you most times of day or night. After midnight I might say no, but before midnight I'm all ears. You see, being a re- not being a reader isn't an excuse to not having the word of God impacting our lives. So this then is how we're going to strive to enter the rest of God, by having open ears and soft hearts, by hearing God's voice telling us to not be guilty of unbelief, by hearing God's voice saying, stay close to your senior pastor, Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here and you haven't ever yet made that commitment to Jesus. And if you want to inherit the rest, you want that place in heaven, you want that wonderful relationship with God, today is the day. Today is the, say, today is the day to say yes to your senior pastor and your saviour, Jesus. Don't say, well, I'll consider it a day longer. I'll get back to you on that one because tomorrow might not come. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. What does it say? As the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Don't be like some people who are next to a swimming pool on a hot summer's day. Uh, Maybe you've seen them, they kind of dip a toe in the water and go, shall I go in? Shall I not go in? No, I couldn't, uh, not sure. Even though they see others in the water enjoying themselves, they still sit, stand on the edge and kind of go, yeah, I'm not sure. And eventually they go, no, it's not for me. You see, we can be like that with Jesus. We can be close by to others who are experiencing the joys of the rest and the presence of God. We can be with others who've got an assurance that, that heaven is for them, but never make that commitment ourselves. We can see others enjoying the blessings of their sins forgiven and going, yeah, I could consider that. But we never make that commitment. Well, look, if that's you, Hebrews 3 verse 7, today is the day that if we hear his voice, don't harden your heart anymore. Enter the rest that begins by being in the presence of God by having your sins forgiven. And it's for all who come to Christ. Whether you've previously professed and walked away, or whether you've never done it, today is the day that we can inherit the rest of salvation. But there's also a rest to be had for the Christian in this life. Today there is a rest 
available. And it comes through letting God be God and us resting and trusting in his goodness, in his perfectness, in his perfect ways, in the rush, in the craziness of life, rest by coming to the presence of God. Rest comes by knowing our senior pastor is Jesus. Rest comes by knowing we can bring all our worries, all our concerns, all our troubles, all our anxieties, all our weariness into his presence. Even your deepest fears and your personal struggles can be brought to him. We can rest, not because we leave our problems behind, not because by coming to Jesus our problems suddenly disintegrate, but because we've left them in our senior pastor's hands. Maybe you're of the self-reliant variety. And I put my hand up here and I confess this is me. I am self-reliant far too often. I'm proud of my ability to handle many things at work and in my family and myself. And I go, oh, haven't I done well? I am guilty of being a self-reliant type. Maybe that's you. What have I learned this week? I've learned that Jesus is my senior pastor and all my troubles and all my concerns I have to bring to him. And by doing that, I know that he can take care of my problems because he's good at his job. So if you're the self-reliant variety like me, know that Jesus is your senior pastor and find rest in him. Or maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you're not self-reliant at all. Maybe you look at those self-reliant people who think, you know, they must be on caffeine 24-7. They don't stop. And maybe I'm the opposite. I'm inadequate. That's not me at all. And maybe in that inadequacy, you kind of go, I just don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I'm good enough for God. I'm trying hard as a Christian, but I always seem to fail. I... I'm inadequate. Well, Jesus says to you, I'm your saviour and your senior pastor. You don't need to make yourself good enough because I'm good enough at my job. I've died for your sin. I've died for your inadequacies. Stop comparing yourself to others. Instead, come to me. Leave your burdens and inadequacies with me. I'm your senior pastor who wants to care for you. So are you weary? I am. Are you tired? Are you full of burdens? I am. Do you long for rest? Come to Jesus, my Saviour. Come to Jesus, your Saviour and your senior pastor. Let's pray. A moment for you to deal with the Lord yourself to start with. Lord, please forgive our failure. Please forgive us uh, for feeling inadequate or feeling self-reliant. Please forgive us for not recognising day after day that you're our saviour and our senior pastor. Lord, help us to find rest in you, knowing that we can lift all our burdens to you now and know that we can have an assurance of the rest of heaven by having open ears and a soft heart. Amen. Afterwards, we've got plenty of food to eat. We'll have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee afterwards. Keep talking to each other, keep sharing with each other. Um, talk about what we've what we've learnt this morning to continue to build each other, encourage each other every day. And we can do that right now, can't we? Um, stay for lunch. We'd love to. We don't want to go out in that weather. Come and stay for lunch. Stay with us. Have some lunch with us, and uh, let's encourage each other today. So. Let's close by singing uh, just this wonderful song together. Um, let's stand and sing. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress.
eternal covenant brought back from the dead our lord jesus that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through jesus christ to whom be glory for ever and ever amen mm-hmm. 